What is the most efficient and effective way to rapidly scale your nonprofit fundraising? How can you possibly 10x your nonprofit funding, say from $100,000 a year to a million a year so you can grow your impacts? A bit over a month ago, I teamed up with nonprofit fundraising expert Jake Lyons to answer that very question. It was awesome to see so many of you in that webinar live and in person, but if you missed it, have no fear. We're gonna replay some of the meatiest parts of that webinar here today. And if you're new to this channel and watching this video, hey, I'm Amber Melanie Smith. I'm a nonprofit founder, social entrepreneur, and social impact YouTuber. And I make educational content here on this channel all about nonprofits, fundraising, leadership, social issues, and more. Be sure to check out my new website, changemakercafe.com, where you can find organized links of all my content on these topics, as well as information about upcoming live events that you might want to tune in for. All right, let's get into this. I do want to have a disclaimer, though, that unfortunately, the very first part of this webinar did get cut off, but we're going to jump right into the good stuff here. I'll give you a little lead in for context. Jake is explaining all of the ways that nonprofits can raise money, but there's one strategy in particular that is proven to be the most effective for that large scale rapid growth that we're talking about. Here's what he says. Of all dollars given away, 90% of all dollars given away is of course, next slide, individual major gifts. So if you're in a point where you're just starting and you don't have a very robust and well-diversified fundraising program yet, or your philanthropy program is not as mature as you'd like to be, or you're just not raising as much money, the biggest lever you can pull is optimizing just individual major gifts. Now we can give you advice and, and tell you how to optimize all these different things. We do a lot of these things really well. Our clients do most of these things really well. But if we're starting off with an organization, this is where we focus because we say, hey, if we're going to get dollars in the door, just the fastest cash you can get. It's not a pyramid scheme. It's not a get rich quick scheme. It's just, this is where the most of the money comes from. And some of it has to do with the income uh, distribution in the country. I'm not trying to make any political statements one way or the other about where that is. But the reality is most money is given away by very wealthy individuals. It's the one and two percenters, even across the pandemic. You know, we, we expected, of course, in 2020, for charitable giving to drop. Charitable giving follows the S&P 500 or the 500 largest corporations in the stock market almost one to one. It's not as volatile, but we can predict within one to 2% accuracy every single year about how much money is given away total in the world based on how the global economy is doing and how the US economy is doing, which is a big driver of that uh, in, this, in this age. So if we know that it's going well in 2020, when it dropped, we expected, of course, you know, fundraising to fall off 2020, actually, we raised more as, as a country than we did in 2019, a lot of crisis fundraising, but fewer individuals gave money away. So we saw the dollar amount go up and we saw the number of donors for the first time since 2008 go down. What that indicates is that fewer people are giving bigger gifts. And that trend continued, you know, even into 2021, 22, all the way up to now. You know, giving is up again. We have a little spike as the economy has gone back up and inflation's kind of cooled off. Um, but that trend of these very small group of people giving away the most money has not really changed since then. Uh, so instead of being sad about that, we're like, okay, we're just going to go do that. If those are the people who are giving away the money and that's how we can get the money and that's where most of the money to charity is going these days, let's figure out how to do that really well and almost ignore the rest until we have a really strong major gifts program in place. Now, if you have grants that you apply for every year and that you get every year, don't stop doing those. If you have a successful year and appeal that you do, don't stop doing that, obviously. But as much as you can, Spend that time on major gifts. We'll go to the next slide. A nonprofit should spend over 90% of its fundraising time and resources on major gifts and a tiny fraction of them actually do. So if, if it's like, okay, if this is 90% of our income or should be 90% of our optimized income, then we should be spending at least 90% of our time on that. But because it's difficult and scary and we don't know where to start and we don't know where to find these donors and we're going to talk about some of these problems that, that we sent in the poll about how do we overcome these things we just end up not doing it it's a lot safer to make a, a, a mail thing and send it out it's a lot easier to be on social media it's a lot easier to put on a fundraising event even though that is also very hard um, it's just a scary thing that most people don't have the comfortability the training the knowledge 
Um, so they just don't do it, even though this is by far the fastest path to money. So let's talk about how we actually do this. Let's talk about the actual process for this. Next slide. All right, scaling your fundraising quickly. I know this seems pretty simple, but I'm actually gonna break down these three steps. I'll give you kind of an overview and then we'll go slide by slide onto each of these things. Uh, the first step is to build a prospect list of people who could give at this level, might give at this level that you have access to. Um, what we love to do is bring together all the staff and leadership of our clients, uh, whether it's the board or whether it's the exec team, a combination of all of them, uh, your donors who may have already contributed some and want to find other people, and let's make a big prospect list of those who could give big. Now, a major gift is different for all organizations. For a large nonprofit, it's probably six or seven figures. Um, for a smaller, it might be $10,000 is a major gift. I kind of qualified differently. I think the national average is 50 when you talk about like education, religion, and healthcare, the big three. Um, but we'll say any any type of major gift, someone who could give substantially where they would have transformational impact on your budget this month, this year. So you want to work together to build a big prospect list. We'll talk to the details in a second. The second thing is you got to go down and sit, sit with these people. It, maybe the first meeting is not necessarily to make an ask, but you got to get in front of these people face to face in person if you can. And this is the hard part. This is the part that requires a lot of training and reps and practice and active listening. And it's not sitting behind a desk and it requires a little bit of learning on how to do this. But to get that started, you have to at least pick up the phone and call these people and talk about, hey, I'd love to sit down with you and walk you through these things. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that as well. And the final thing is to make asks. We have a lot of fundraising programs that when we start working with them and, and they haven't been clients a long time, maybe they're setting a lot of appointments, but they're not actually saying the words. The number one reason people don't give money is because they are not asked. 60%, 60% of donors last year said they would have given more if only they were asked. Like, well, they asked for 10,000. I would have given a lot more than that, but that's what they asked for. So I'm not going to raise it up. That seems like what they needed since that's what they asked for. They're trusting us as the charity, as the nonprofit to demonstrate what we actually need. And they're expecting to be asked. A lot of times, if you're involved in a campaign, your closest supporters are offended if you don't go to them first. They say, I, I would have thought you would have involved me in this. Um, so we're very, very apologetic. The thing that I try to always express and that we, we really need to remember is it's hard to ask because we feel like, oh, again, we're taking a handout. I don't like asking for things. I don't like being needy. We're not asking for ourselves. We're asking on behalf of the people who don't get to ask. They don't get a voice. The people we serve would love to ask for support and help, but they don't get to, but we do. So we have to put on a brave face for those people. Let's break these down. Number, number one, your prospect list. Here's how we love to build this. We build out a list of 10 or 25 names, and you can do this now if you want, or you can do it right after you log off the webinar. 10 or 25 names, just kind of a brain dump of people you think might contribute to your organization. We rate them on three scales, from a scale from one to 10. One to 10 on inclination, which is how likely you think they'd give. A 10 is they'd absolutely give something. One would be a long shot. Five is I don't really know. One to 10. Ability is how much money you think they could give. Maybe a 10 is like $100,000 or a million dollars, huge gift. And a one is, ooh, I, they would be stretching to give us even $1,000, you know, one to 10. And then access is how quickly you can get to these people. If you can text them and you know them personally, that's probably a 10. If you don't know them and don't know someone who knows them, that's probably a one and kind of in between. And then you just add those scores up out of 30 and that's who you go to first. If you score anyone 30 out of 30 where they're excited about your mission, you know them personally and they can give a big gift, I would definitely encourage you to have lunch with them as quickly as possible and talk about something substantial. Uh, you kind of start with your 30s and then your 29s, 28s. Maybe you don't have any of those. Maybe you start with your 23s and then your 22s and you work your way down. Always go with your easiest yeses first, but you want to start with building a prospect list and actually qualifying them on these three scales, which are pretty much weighted equally, inclination, ability, and access. If you're stuck on how do I even find these people to start with, this is people that you know. Uh, these are people on your board. This is people that your board knows. This is why we love to do this exercise with our board, with our leadership team, with our exec team, uh, supporters of other nonprofits locally who are in the same space, uh, past donors. Number one indicator if someone's going to give is if they've given before. Uh, event attendees. If you put on fundraising events and you've never asked those people who show up year after year for a major gift, 
that's a wonderful indication that they might be really excited about some of the stuff that you're excited about as well. Um, people whose friends and family were served, this especially applies in, in education and in healthcare, where it's not necessarily people who are on the poverty level le that you're serving, but might be in, in a, a different space. Uh, your corporate sponsors, we'd love to sit down with them and say, hey, you know, we, you've been a big supporter of ours for years at the events. Would you like to, to partner with us as an organization to have, you know, credentialing across our website and everything else? Lots of places you can go for this prospect list, but working to build it. Second thing is actually setting the appointment and trying to call. Now, this is an example script because we get asked all the time. You get asked all the time, what do you say when you get on the phone with these people? Now, there's a thousand things you could say. Here's just one version of that you can use. Feel free to have this. Again, this recording, I believe, is being made available or you can screenshot this. Um, happy to use this. Steal this from me. Uh, but come up with your own. Put your own spin on this. Uh, hey, Sally, really glad I caught you. How you doing? A little bit of small talk there. Yeah, we're doing well too. I'm just over here at insert organization here. And I know you're busy, so I'll keep it brief. We're looking to expand our, and then you talk about a specific program, not our nonprofit, but say it's a, a free clinic. Uh, we're looking to expand our dental care program. And I know you're a big supporter of that in the past. I'm just really thankful for all you've done for us. I wanted to sit down with you and share some of the exciting new stuff we're planning over the next couple months could we grab coffee next week, maybe next Thursday at nine? Uh, so again, you're not going to sneak up on these people. When they have a development director or a nonprofit director who wants to take them to lunch, what do they think the meeting is about? If they're a supporter in the past, they probably do want to sit down with you. But if you get a no here, it's a pretty good indication they're not interested. But this is kind of the first step. You want to just not try to sneak up on them and say, oh, yeah, I'm just going to tell you about stuff. It's like, no, I we have a new dental program we're trying to fund. I'd like to tell you about it. If it's not a good fit, good either way, but at least we'll know at that point. That's what we say. They're saying that is, yes, absolutely. At the next step, of course, is the ask itself. Now, again, this is, there's a hundred different ways, but this is another one of the top questions we get. What are the words that I actually say when I sit down and ask for money? Now, this could be a whole webinar on its own and maybe a, a future topic for Amber uh, and, and company, but um, here's just one way that I like to use uh, to be able to make an ask. Sally, right now, our, I'll use the example again, dental care program is only open two days per week and we can serve about 50 patients per month. And that's only about 20% of the people who can't afford uh, dental care in the area. We need to raise 1.5 million over the next couple of years uh, for more operatories and uh, another dental assistant to come in. And that allows us to be open five days a week. And we can take that 20% to over half of the indigent care population of our entire community, get them out of pain. Um, now, to do that, obviously, we're going to go to the community for campaign gifts and recognition with naming opportunities, some of the new space that we're building. Um, but before we do that, we, of course, wanted to come to you because we'd love for you to consider naming our new space, our new lobby uh, for a pledge of half a million dollars over the next three years to get us started. Is that something that you'd be interested in doing? So what I've done here is I've presented this as an offer instead of a request. It's not as scary when I have to do that. Say, hey, you know, these, these donations, these naming opportunities, they're going to fly off the shelf. Um, but before we do that, is there something that you would want to do as kind of a lead gift? I, you know, we're going to, this is going to go public, but while we're still in kind of the planning phase, I wanted to sit down with you and just kind of get your take on it. Would you want to name one of these spaces before I get started? Oh my gosh, that's so kind. I can't believe you thought of me. Um, again, one approach of many, not the, the be all end all, but I found that to be pretty effective. Um, so you really want to kind of walk through these steps of making your prospect list, calling them as often as possible. Again, this is something you want to do every week. You, you get to work on Monday morning. Who are my top three? Can I make five appointments, which, which will result in one to two lunches every single week. And I can do that for 50 of my weeks in the year. And if even a third of those people say yes, that's a tremendous amount of revenue. Very, very quickly go from uh, you know under six figures uh, per year to over six figures per month in that case, uh, kind of doing this. And we've seen our clients had a lot of success with this. Uh, so with that, we'll take a brief break here. And go to, of course, uh, your biggest fundraising challenges, because I know there's a lot of hurdles in this process. I've, I've obviously simplified this process so it can fit inside a, a short webinar here. So what kind of questions do y'all have um, that we can kind of address individually before we continue? And I'm going to launch this, uh, this poll really quick so that you all can answer. All right, the poll is launched. If you want to, it should have popped up on your screen, but just kind of would love to hear where you're at with some of the specific challenges that you're facing. I know Jake's kind of alluded to some of these already. And I also saw a couple questions in the Q&A related to some of these things. So it feels like we're kind of in alignment here, but thank you. Keep those uh, poll answers coming in. The numbers are just jumping all over the place. It's gonna be really interesting when we land. 
All right, a couple more people to participate here. I'm seeing a lot of people, almost half so far, reporting that finding and connecting to major donors is a top concern. Not terribly surprised there. Followed by engaging new donors. That's kind of parallel to that. I'll give you all just a, another minute or so to drop your answer in if you haven't had a chance yet. Um, and then a couple of comments in the chat to supplement that as well. Um, Betsy says, bandwidth, no one's designated to support you with development. It's your role as executive director. I hear that. Jamie, my challenge is getting the business community to support uh, education for grants. Say more about what you mean by that. And while you think about that, I'm gonna close this poll and we'll take a look at the results. Okay, so, uh, I've hit share results, so hopefully you all can see this as well, but here's what we're looking at, right? So we have 41% of you who have said finding and connecting to major donors is the top concern, followed by engaging new donors. Like we said, that's kind of parallel to that, 23%, followed by funding infrastructure and operational needs. Um, so, of course, you know, we've talked about funding programs a little bit, um, but we have to do that capacity building, too. And then equipping the staff and the board to support fundraising, followed by reengaging last donors. So a good spread there, but definitely it seems like that discovery of new donors is a top issue here. I'm going to stop sharing this, and then um, we're going to get into some of the questions that we're seeing here from you all specifically. Yeah, I can kind of go in reverse order here. I'll start with uh, Dick's question mm -hmm. here. My main challenge is getting my rear end gear to start going for some local <laughs> grants. I hear you. Yeah, that's that's definitely a challenge. And and what I don't like about local grants is even if you get them, they tend not to be large enough to be worth the time. And what I mean by this is, on average, if you look at like salary time and just investment overall in grants, it's anywhere from twenty to twenty five cents on the dollar to raise a dollar. So it costs you 20 to 25 cents. Uh, if you feel like your time is worth more than that, even, and it's done by a volunteer, it's probably even worse than that. Major gifts are anywhere from three to eight cents on the dollar. Um, so if you have any uh, thing left in the tank, I would say maybe pivot a little bit towards uh, seeking out and sitting down with private individual donors who may give through their foundation. Um, but the thing about applying for foundations is they're still people. Like you, they have this very bureaucratic process where you have to online, you got to pull all this stuff and there's a committee. Realistically, if you can get in touch with the person whose foundation that is and have lunch with them, they'll just green light it. They, they can send money. All rules are made up. So they're like, well, there's a process. And I saw online, there's an application. Of course they have that. They have to do that to filter the, all the nonprofits who have wonderful missions in town who are trying to get money. But the reality is if you can talk to the boss and you can talk to the people who run the foundation and they get excited about what you're doing with you, with your mission, a lot of times you can skip the line. You're not sitting in the general admission line. You're in the VIP. Uh, I also want to point out we have a couple of questions in the Q&A itself. I don't, I don't think yeah, you can see I, those. I can see that. I, I have uh, admin privileges, it seems. That's good. Uh, I'll can. go to Jamie's question here since Jamie's clarified. Uh, many businesses say they support a sense of belonging when they seek sponsorships, uh, find ways around which don't fit our pillar. And that's the toughest thing. See, with businesses... It can be a little bit quid pro quo. If I want to give away money, I can just do that. Same thing with you. If you want to give to a charity, most of the time you can just decide, or maybe you and your spouse have to decide together. But for the most part, you're just deciding. When businesses give away money, they have to justify it to shareholders, partners, employees. That was my raise. That was my bonus. That was our quarterly profits. So you have to give them a reason as to why, and it's much more challenging. It's why business gifts account for only uh, of the total cash giving pile, like anywhere from 10 to 15%. So even if they're counted as individuals, often not coming from businesses as often. Uh, a corporate partnership program is, is a, a good way to approach that, um, but usually pretty tough. The best way to see if you can find those same business owners and see if they'd be willing to give personally, but then recognition for their business or vice versa. They may want to give through their business and, and alleviate some corporate income tax and be recognized with them and their spouse. Um, but again, approaching foundations as people, approaching businesses as people, almost always the way to go. I'll skip over here to the Q&A to get some of these. Um, can you comment further on including corporate sponsors as individuals? This is actually our primary focus, but we could be doing more with individuals. Feel people suffer from having a broad and a staff mostly comprised of people. 
Yes. Uh, so I can go one more point on this and then we'll kind of move out of corporate donations a little bit. Um, if you can find someone on your board or who's given to your organization or that you know or that your neighbor knows who holds a decision-making position on one of those businesses, that's by far the best way to get that process started. It's like, oh yeah, you're saying, of course, approach them as individuals, but really it's, it's just to get connected to them the same way you would as if they were going to be a private donor and saying, yes, I happen to know that the McMahon law firm might give, but I've got to talk to Jamie McMahon so that I could actually start this process. Going to their like corporate uh, set of steps is going to take us too long. I got to find someone who uh, serves on another board with them. They may serve on a board of another nonprofit and your board member serves with them. Can they set you up? Can the three of y'all have lunch together? It's almost always the best way to do that. I'll go in reverse order here. How do I help my team and myself to overcome the fear of asking for money? I'm afraid if we'll put people off and pressure them into donating. And this is one of the toughest things that we do. As humans, we fear rejection. You know, this is, goes back to like caveman times where like if you were rejected, you would die in the Arctic. Uh, so we're very much programmed to want to belong and not to rock the boat too hard. It's difficult for us to, to have that. That's why it's hard to ask out your crush. It's why it's hard uh, to ask for things in general that you think are not going to give any kind of reciprocity. Um, the first thing is practice and training. You can do little literal solicitation practice. So when I'm going for a gift, especially if I'm with a partner, we'll role play it. I know it sounds silly, but you'll have someone act as a donor and you'll say, hey, these are the three or four concerns they're probably going to have. We're going to go through, I'm going to say the ask exactly like, it. it's like preparing for a public speech. We're going to say the ask exactly how we're going to say it. You're going to ask me the hardest questions you can think of and, and, and not be very nice about it so that I'm prepared. And that when we go to the actual meeting, we do a lot of that. The other thing to remember is that if the ask goes well, it's just as much listening as it is talking. So if I'm going to sit down and I'm going to ask Amber for money, I might say something like, Amber, I, I know you've been a supporter of ours and, and I'll, I'll talk kind of talk about what our projects are for this upcoming year, but why did you first get involved with us? What, what was it kind of that, that compelled you to support our mission in the first place? And that gives Amber a platform to share about what excites about the mission. And then we can kind of use that to kind of weave. So it's, it's very much an active listening process. It's not like, okay, I got to set the appointment. I got to get down and have lunch. And then I have to say this perfect paragraph like you put on slide four. It's like, really, you're just trying to foster a human connection with the person. And that comes with a lot of active listening and questions. Again, if they've sat down with a development director or the ED of a nonprofit, they know what the meeting's about. They expect to ask. But you want to spend the majority of that time kind of getting to know what they're passionate about. Like people usually have about three charities that they're really excited about or three kind of general causes. Some people are very environmentally conscious. Some people, uh, you know, give to their church. Some people support their alma mater. Whatever their thing is, ask them what it is and try to figure out what it is. But then why they felt like giving was the best way to kind of do that in the first place. Uh, so wonderful question. I'll scroll Jake, I think we have time ahead, for maybe buddy. one more and then yeah. we should go to the next section. But don't worry, folks, we'll have more time at the end for yes. the rest of the <laughs> I'll go to Sophia. I'm just going to pick one out here. Um, we have a couple of large funders, 100K to 200K. Great. Uh, if one of them pulls out, it's a big organizational risk. That is very true. <laughs> at the moment, these are yearly grants. So if we don't get a renewal, we don't have the money within a month or two. Yes, yeah, so challenging. You have any ideas on how to manage this risk? Sophia, it's a great question. I feel like a lot of people uh, on here and otherwise probably in the same boat. Um, this is a very, very common thing. Um, it is the pool of your total large donors might be a little bit too small to do what you're wanting and trying to do. So the the obvious solution besides doing a wonderful job with stewardship, um, the, the like, uh, data support that seven meaningful touches in between asks is like the correct amount. So you want to have phone calls, thank yous, handwritten card conversations, roughly seven times before you ask a gift again. You can space those out at least a year apart. It's even better. So doing a wonderful job of stewardship um, will be the first box to check. But the second is uh, to, to find additional people at that level. And if you don't know where to start, you could probably start with those funders. The next time you sit down with them and say, hey, I'm not going to ask you for any money today. We're obviously, you know, in the middle of your, your pledge payment for the year. Obviously very thankful for your support. Wanted to see, is there anyone else that you know that you might be able to connect us to who also would be really excited about this work? Anyone in your network who might, you know, even if they weren't going to be a donor, that just would be a good person for us to know. Oh yeah, my friend Sharon is blah, blah, blah. Could you connect me with Sharon? Maybe all three of us could have lunch or I'd be happy to go visit Sharon. But if you could help set up that introduction, that would be wonderful. Most people who can give $100,000, $200,000 a year 
no other people who have that level of means. Uh, I forget the phenomenon, but it's it's we just tend to group ourselves within our same social class that has something to do with proximity of where we live, the health clubs we go to, the schools we go to, the cities we live in, all of that. But for the most part, uh, going out and finding new people or new at least new prospects at that level is going to be the only answer besides besides stewardship. Excellent question. All right, we'll move on right along. I wish I could get to more questions, but again, we'll circle back at some of these at the end. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jake. Okay, we are going to get into part two of Jake's wonderful lessons here. Um, okay, creating a strong foundation for fundraising success. Let's hear it. Awesome. So obviously, scaling up your major gifts is like kind of the, okay, we need fast cash strategy, and anyone can do it without a lot of organizational infrastructure. You don't need a lot of uh, program components to do that. You can either by yourself make that list score on the three categories, make the calls and go out and talk to people, or you can do that at your next board meeting, at your next staff meeting and make a collective list and then assign out different people to be connectors and you could go be the closer. Great way to get quickly in that. What we also wanna talk about is a little bit more sustainable. What are the program components uh, that are in place for these very successful nonprofits who have very strong fundraising programs that are the continual revenue. So you obviously you build out the, the fast cash, but what can I do to make sure that I have reliable income that I can budget for? I have kind of five top strategies that our clients are most successful with. Uh, this is obviously through a lot of trial and error, um, made a lot of errors to get to what we feel are kind of the best lineup of stuff. So I want to kind of share these five with you. Number one is blocking time for major gifts. It's not necessarily you have to do certain things or you have to uh, have so many per month or we have to have missed this many asks or you're hitting your KPIs. I will take, and we do this with all of our clients, all of our development directors, and even if our EDs, they don't have a full-time fundraising person, they're the fundraiser. They can find maybe two hours a week from nine to 11 on Tuesdays. I will make progress on major gifts that might look like refining my prospect list. It might look like calling a board member to get new prospects. It might be calling someone on my prospect list to try to set a lunch. It might be researching this prospect to see where else they've given. Lots of things you can do that move something along in the major gifts continuum. But even if you're a 40 hour a week person or less, I would recommend at least a couple of hours in the week where you're doing just that. And you set it as, as a meeting. Like you wouldn't cancel a meeting with someone else in your organization. So you should hopefully try to have the same courtesy with yourself and say, yeah, I got that two hours. Now, if someone says, hey, I, I, wanna, I wanna meet with you at nine o'clock on Tuesday, you can say, sure, but you can't delete that two hour block of major gifts. You just move it to a new spot. And if it gets all the way moved to where it's Friday afternoon, and someone wants to meet you at three o'clock, you say, sorry, but we can meet on Monday. I'm not available this afternoon. Um, if you're a full-time fundraiser, obviously two hours is way too little. I would recommend like 20 to 30 hours on this, ideally. Um, but if you feel like with the amount of grants and other things you have, or so maybe you're a split responsibility with your marketing team, or you are the marketing team, try to get to 10. But like bare minimum of two, if you do two hours every week for the remainder of the year, you will see good revenue. If you do 20 hours a week, you will see that much more revenue. It's that many more appointments. Uh, but really being disciplined about blocking time, strategy one. All right, number two, doing a wonderful job with stewardship. As I mentioned before, you want to have about seven touches in between each gift. Um, and for our clients, we always try to set up uh, kind of a stewardship program or a stewardship calendar. So like every February, everyone gets a Valentine's card from us. Every November, they get a handwritten note from our board. Uh, they get a phone call in July, wishing them a happy 4th July or whatever that thing is. So no matter what month of the year that they first give, once they've gone through a year, they've gotten seven somethings. They've gotten seven personal touches of some kind before they're asked again. On average, it's at least five times, sometimes up to six or seven times as expensive for your organization to capture a new donor than just to keep your existing ones. Now, even though that's the case, the attrition rate for donors is terrible. It's really bad, especially in the US. I think it's like 42% last year of people who gave to a nonprofit gave again the next year. And it's not because they didn't want to. It's because most organizations do not a great job with stewardship. Um, if a business only retained 42% of its customers, it would be bankrupt immediately. And yet we don't have that same level of drive uh, for our donors. These are real people that we want to create real relationships with. And to make the donations feel less transactional, we want to try to connect with them as much as possible. Maybe you get to a point where you have so many donors, you can't connect with all of them that way. So you start with a segment, say everyone 10,000 and up gets seven touches. Everyone 5,000 and up gets four touches. Everyone who gives at least gets something. 
once per year. But the further down you can go, and especially if you're just starting out, really doing a wonderful job with stewardship, so much less expensive. And that way you can grow on your base of support saying, okay, well, we, we raised $280,000 in 2023. That's our minimum for 2024 because we've done a wonderful job with stewardship. Any new gifts that we get, all that year's worth of work is on top of that 280. It's reliable revenue we can count on. All right, number three. When you set goals, and this goes for life in general, this is good life advice on top of good fundraising advice, try not to set just output goals. We want to raise $500,000. That's an output goal. You can't actually control how much money comes in. What you can control is input goals. I want to call five people per week to try to set up appointments to ask for major gifts. Of those five people, I want to have one lunch meeting or one coffee per week to try to ask for a gift. I want to make five asks a month. I want to make 10 asks per month. These are things that you can actually put on your to-do list and put on your agenda. You can't put raise $100,000 on your to-do list for the week, but you can put make 25 phone calls or send 10 outreach emails or reach out to every single board member one at a time and ask for their potential prospect list that I can go. So we, when, you're, when you're making goals, it's fine to have a fundraising goal. We actually encourage that. We set those with our clients as well. But if you're setting just output goals without a strategy and then a system to support that, they tend to be New Year's resolutions, which of course also most people fail. Um, so just really, really encourage you making sure that you're nailing your input goals. And it goes back to kind of tip number one is like set time for it. Like, okay, if I have to make five calls per week, I have to schedule time for that. I have to be very disciplined about not letting that go if it's the most important thing that we do. Philanthropy can be by far, by far your biggest revenue stream, but that's only the case if you're disciplined about doing a little bit of work every single week. All right, number four. Some sort of case for support. Now, it used to be the case, no pun intended, that nonprofits could say, hey, we're a charity. And we promise we will spend your money well because we're very nice. And that used to work. Even like in the you know late 20th century, uh, worked just fine. As donors have become more sophisticated and our total donor pool for major gifts has, has shrunken and become in a smaller group of people with less money, those people are getting hit up all the time. We have to have a very, very strong case for support to just set ourselves aside and apart from some of the other nonprofits that we're competing for. People who are generous are giving away money or their attorney says they have to give away money every year. They're going to do that. We just have to make sure that we have a more compelling case than some of the others in our area or just make people aware of what we do. A good case for support has three key pieces of information. So if you have this wonderful case statement that talks about what you do, I would highly encourage you three key pieces of information. Number one, is the status quo. Right now, there are this many stray dogs in our area. Right now, there are this many people without health care. Right now, there are no after-school programs available for this demographic. Uh, right now, this there's a food desert in this area. All these people here only have access to gas station food. None of, there's not a walkable grocery store nor a bus route that gets into a grocery store. We talk about the status quo. This is the thing, the problem we're trying to solve. Piece number two is how much money you need, specifically, and where you intend to spend it. So we need $5 million to build a food bank. This is how much money it costs. If we get $5 million, it will result in a new food bank or whatever. But very, very specifically, this is a dollar amount that we need. Not, oh, we need some money. We need 1.7 million. We need 600,000. We need 200,000. Whatever your number is, we need this much money. And this is exactly how we intend to spend it if we do get it. And the third piece is the new future you imagine if you get that money. So again, you have status quo, amount of money you need and how you're gonna spend it. And then of course, number three is, if we do raise this money, there won't be a food desert anymore. 40% of the kids will have access to this. We can reduce the number of strays by this percent. Whatever that is, some sort of pre-impact statement of like, this is the problem we can solve. It, it kind of shows you like, hey, we have a plan. Like we've already figured it out. We, we know how to solve this problem. We've identified a problem and we've identified the solution. We just need money. That's it. We don't need to figure out how to do all this. We just need the funding. And that's why I'm here today. I'd love to have you support this much so we can do this, this, and this. Or your donation of this allows this many kids to do this. Um, so just being very, very specific in your case statement. A lot of times we see with emerging nonprofits, they'll start with just kind of talking in general about, oh, we serve this population. It's like, that's wonderful, but I really, really do need to know specifically what you're doing. And if I give money, what new thing will happen? So in your case statement, make sure you hit those three boxes every single time. All right. Final strategy before moving to the closing here. 
One of the things that we make sure that we prioritize in the beginning is getting volunteers involved just for fundraising. You probably have some level of volunteers, whether it's your board or otherwise, uh, volunteers who serve uh, with your charity, with your organization. We like to build out with our clients anywhere from 30, sometimes as many as 50 volunteers just dedicated to philanthropy and have them organized into committees, one that does corporate support only, one that does your annual campaign, a one that does just major gifts. And you don't have to start with 30 people. You can start with five or three. Um, but there's so many hours in the week. Say you feel, figured out how to fill up your week so that you can do 38 of your 40 hours in fundraising. You're like, I'm killing it. Your 38 hours of solo work of your paid time will never beat 45 people also working on the same thing. Like you, you just run out of leverage at some point. You're a human, you have so many hours in the week and you probably can't spend most of them fund fundraising of any kind. So spending a little bit of time up front, uh, recruiting volunteers. And where do you find these people? It's the same list as your major gifts and your, your regular donors. It's donors, board members, people that those people know, people that you know, people who the organization have served. Three hours a month, probably, including a monthly meeting is probably all we need from these people but you really wanna to try to build out some sort of something that's called a philanthropy council uh, or volunteer council of, uh, of, of fundraisers, people who they don't necessarily have to ask for money, but it's really about helping make connections. You know, if you have 25 community members, um, even outside of your board, they all have their own networks of people uh, and their own prospect list that they can get. And, and even if they don't necessarily want to go and ask for money, they can connect you or have lunch with you um, and their person so that you can kind of exponentially increase the amount of people you could approach uh, for a gift. So definitely want to work out to build that out. A little bit of ex extra upfront work, uh, but entirely worth it. Okay. With that, we will move into our next set and try to get more of these questions in. Yeah. So this is our final round of Q&A time. So if you haven't had a chance to already, feel free to drop any lingering questions in that Q&A. We also, as Jake knows, have several we didn't get a chance to answer before. So you want to pick one of those and jump right in? Yeah, I can be kind of quick. Some of these are, are faster ones. I'll go from the top this time. Um, social impact business. Uh, so it's a benefits corporation versus a nonprofit really has to do with tax status. We always recommend a 501c3 just because it's cleaner. Um, public benefit corporations are legally required to have some sort of purpose, just like a nonprofit does, but they can make money and that money is taxed. Whereas a 501c3 doesn't have any shareholders and all the money that's made, a, a nonprofit definitely wants to profit. You don't wanna be not profitable. It just means that the money doesn't go to shareholders, it goes back into the organization. So if, if you're trying to do good, um, obviously a 501c3 is the best way to do it. You can still pay yourself a salary. Totally fine. Amber's got some great resources on her channel and her website uh, to talk you through that. But that's the first one. Uh, donor advised funds or third party funding. Um, great way to do it. If you can get connected to those people, a lot of times, uh, the community foundation in your, uh, local community will have specific funds towards that. So if you can, uh, make friends, uh, with the community foundation director and say, Hey, are, do you have anyone who's interested in these spaces or anyone that gives in these spaces? Great direction there. Uh, PayPal giving a little bit hit and miss. I will say that the top level demographic is not going to give through PayPal because they tend to take a, a big enough percentage that it ends up being pretty substantial. So I would call that a wonderful supplemental, uh, uh revenue source, uh, but not necessarily the top. Um, what kind of benefits do corporate sponsors get apart from visibility? Usually not a lot. Um, now if it's like a healthcare organization, you can do things like health screenings, but you got to be really careful that you can't quid pro quo stuff because that's illegal. Again, Amber has some resources about what you can and can't do there. Uh, the biggest thing is that the cost per impression that a nonprofit can offer through sponsorship is usually much cheaper than their marketing budget. So most corporations will have like a percent and a half allocation towards charitable giving every year. Most Fortune 100 companies have a foundation, Coca-Cola Foundation, Chick-fil-A Foundation, et cetera. Um, but what we want to do is get out of that one and a half percent and into their marketing budget saying, you know, you're buying billboard space, which gets roughly this many impressions. And I know you're paying around this much. Pay us a tenth of that for a hundred times the impressions, and it's all tax deductible. So it's not just visibility. It's hey, you know, we can pull some of your marketing budget this way, and it really helps. I'm gonna keep going here. And Amber, if you see one that you really want to to make sure we dig into, please please interrupt me. Uh, if a non whoop, nonprofit registered outside the U.S. is there a benefit for major donor to donate major gifts? Uh, taxable benefit. It's not how can we engage. Uh, it depends on the organization. That is a complicated answer. It depends on where that organization is based. It depends on if 
the donor is putting their money into a fund or a trust or a foundation, which then allocates it, there's usually ways that they can give uh, that will allow that to be tax deductible. Um, just have, it depends on which country and it depends on how they do it. So we definitely uh, advise you to talk to a financial advisor for that one. How often is too often for a major gift? Uh, more than once per year is the bare minimum. That's a pretty easy industry standard for that. Uh, once per year is kind of approaching too long. And, and what I love to do is, is get multi-year pledges. So say they can give $100,000, I'll ask for three to 500,000 over the next three to five years. And that way I can spend three to five years never asking them for anything, only thanking them, telling them cool stories, sharing impact, love going into the pledge model. If you have someone who can give 10,000 or more, definitely try to get a pledge instead of a one-time gift. Gives them flexibility as well. They can round it into different tax years and that kind of thing. But a year should be probably the bare minimum for that. So far as events go, uh, do you think events are a good way to raise money? No, I do not. Uh, those are the most expensive ways to raise money. And I know that nonprofits use them as friend raisers or as ways to re-engage. But once we raise friends through those events, most people don't do anything with that anyways. It's about 50 cents on the dollar. So you're spending at least half of that money that you raise at the event. It's like, oh, we netted $400,000. It's like, but how many months did you spend planning that event that that raised $800,000? It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so yes, events have a place for very mature programs. But if you're just starting out, please do zero. The most successful, highest operating nonprofits in the country have zero special events, zero. Uh, recognition events, we love those. Throw a party for just your donors to, to recognize them and give them some fellowship and talk about impact. Awesome. But having to get auction items and a band and all the stuff and corporate sponsors and calling everybody, it's way too much work. Uh, what are some effective ways of keeping track of donations? Starting off, Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. Very free, very easy. Uh, secondly, uh, you can get into some of the cheaper uh, donor CRMs or donor databases like Bloomerang. I have no financial affiliation with any of these, just telling you what your options are. And there's kind of your mid-tier ones like Donor Perfect. And then of course, there's the Cadillac, which is very expensive, but has the most bells and whistles, which is BlackBaud's lineup, uh, Razor's Edge and Razor's Edge NXT. So those three are kind of like three different price points. If you're just starting out, I would start with a, with a simple, uh, just Microsoft Excel or something. Salesforce is also kind of an offshoot one. They actually have a pretty decent one as well. Um, Best ways to keep consistent revenue for a nonprofit. Uh, program service revenue being a top one, but on the philanthropy side, uh, recurring donations. So either pledges across multiple years or monthly giving so that you can budget for it. Awesome question there on how to define the threshold of a major gift based on the organization's size or budget. You can start with pledges are at $50,000, being that the national average is a nice home base to start with. So if someone can pledge $50,000 over three to five years, that would be the floor probably for a major gift. And if you're very small, maybe stretch it down to 25,000, um, but probably would try not to go lower than that if you can. You're really setting the precedent here regardless. And people who give big are used to giving the same dollar size regardless of the size of the organization. So you can set the precedent by saying, this is what a major gift is for us. And that kind of allows you to play in the same field. You don't have to be a big organization to ask for big gifts. You can be very small. And the donor is giving to what they're giving to. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, also, they can have a much bigger impact <laughs> with a big gift for your organization. So I would maybe start with 50,000 pledged or maybe 10,000 cash. Maybe a good place to start. Uh, do I have to be based uh, let's see, do I have to be based in a major city to make this work? Absolutely not. I would say 60% of our clients are in very, very rural areas where a lot of the people who have money have very quiet money. Like they're not very flashy, uh, but they're, they've they lived there their whole life. They might have generational wealth. They may have saved. Uh, and it actually works really, really well in that case too. How do you feel about testimonials or storytelling videos? Wonderful. We have the ability to make videos very easily. It used to be that you had to hire a videographer to produce a video. Now we have phones that take really good video. The, the iPhone videos you can make now in camera are better than DSLRs were in 2001. So absolutely wonderful way to do it being on social media. Don't spend too much time there compared to fundraising, but wonderful way to share testimonials. All right, I'm going to go with like two more and then I'll move over to the chat. Yeah, and Jake, yeah, just, yeah, I wanted to flag that there were one or two questions in chat too. Yep. Cool. How do you personalize your approach to different types of donors? Uh, that's a wonderful question because it's something that we definitely want to keep forefront of mind. We want to sit down with them and have conversations about what they're excited about. The best way to kind of categorize them is to ask them questions and get to know them as people. I would say the best way to pretend to care about your donors is to actually care about your donors. Wonderful question. 
Uh, some folks are concerned about giving to a fund that provides a one-time limited cash assistance. How's it going to change anything? Oh, such a tough thing, Madison. I totally feel you there. Suggestions on how to respond while recognizing the limitations. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our clients will have kind of a split. Will they say, yes, 20% of all donations will go into this endowment fund, which supports the sustainability, and the 80% is this. Um, sometimes you can talk about we have a phase one, phase two. Phase one is some immediate cash needs for this, and then we're going to expand our fundraising to kind of support this programmatic thing, which will then provide revenue for the organization. And lastly, sometimes it's about project selection. It's like, can you think of something in your organization that would make money or that would be a little bit more permanent? And can you rope that in as a part or a third uh, of what you're trying to do? That's a really tough one to do, but it's why we see a lot of multi-pillar campaigns these days. Very, very rarely are, are successful nonprofits doing a like, we're raising money for just this one thing. It's usually like a couple different service areas around one thing. Last one, then I'll go to chat. Um, how do I help my team and myself overcome the fear asking for money? I think we uh, addressed that one a little bit earlier, but again, practice. And just like anything else, you got to get reps uh, that are low stakes, low stakes reps. All right. I've been trying to go kind of fast and I apologize if if y'all uh, think it's too fast. I'm trying to get as many of these as we can during this hour. Um, I'm going to go in the chat in reverse order here. Amber, again, if you have one that you want to point out. Yeah, I think it was Rachel. I'm scrolling up a little bit. Um, this is a little bit connected. How do we ask board members for help getting connected is one I saw. Um, from Rachel. And I think Rachel also said multi-year donors discovering yes. that. So for board members, uh, definitely deserve the courtesy of a face-to-face sit-down meeting. An email is going to be your natural inclination. Oh, I can email them all. I can copy paste. I can reply all. Um, I, I would like to have lunch or breakfast or coffee, even if you want to save some money uh, or just sit down with them over, over nothing uh, and, and ask them, say, hey, Amber, you know, you've been really supportive, both with your time and with your resources, you know, really excited about. Obviously, our vision is to try to scale up blank, blank and blank. Anyone not on the board that you have a connection to, he'd be willing to introduce me uh, that might, you know, have a, a, a passion or might be loosely interested in what we're doing, but to sit down face-to-face -face meetings. If you sit down with coffee for someone and ask them for connections, there's a 99% chance they'll give you at least one name. Like Everyone will think of something. If you get them on an email, they say, I don't really know anyone. It's easy to say no to, but a face-to-face -face conversation, they don't, I don't really know anyone or I'll have to think about it. I'll say, great, we have a couple minutes here. I'll give you a second to, to think about it. <laughs> kind of trap them there. What was the and next one? Jake, actually, um, Javonia, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I think that's a great question to sort of end on. I'm looking, we've got okay. two minutes left. Um, how can your team help our organizations, Jake? <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, helping me plug here. Um, so we have a couple different things that we can do. Uh, we either have an online course that's a little bit lower price point that you kind of gets you from zero to your first hundred thousand dollars. And then uh, if you are already raising in the hundred thousand dollar plus per year range, uh, you know, you're a candidate for potentially, uh, you know, our, our private services. Like I said, we have about 20 to 25 clients at any given time, kind of all over the US. And we raise about a hundred million a year for those clients. Um, and we just have like a month retainer fee that we do. So uh, depending on what your budget is and, and where you are in your fundraising journey on what you might need and how, how urgent it is, um, a couple of different options for you, which Amber will be sending out, I believe in, in the follow-up email for this. So, all right, Amber, yes. turn over to wrap us up. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. So just a couple of things to keep in mind as we wrap up. Um, this has been recorded. And like I've been saying, we will send out the recording. So watch your inbox. It's going to come out in a couple days. Um, and the first email you'll see from me is just a, a recap of what we talked about today and links to a couple of resources that Jake has that you can check out just for some additional information, um, some blog articles, research that he's done that could help further your knowledge on this topic. Um, as always, love getting feedback on these webinars. Um, want to hear, you know, what other topics would you like me to cover? What other types of guests would you like me to bring in in the future? So don't hesitate to shoot me an email and share your thoughts or ideas. And thank you all so, so much for joining us today. And that's it. Thank, and you, thank all you for so having much. me, Amber. It was wonderful to be with you. And I really hope all of you took some wonderful things away from this and can go out and raise some money and support the world. Excited That's for what right. you work in the nonprofit sphere. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. All right. If you made it to the end and watched the whole webinar, I'm curious, what did you think? 
I can say from personal experience, I can definitely back up what Jake was saying about major gifts being the highest ROI for nonprofit fundraising. And I really liked what he said about blocking off your calendar to make time for reaching out to donors and make sure you can get really disciplined about that. That can be super effective. As always, I hope you found this interesting and valuable and helpful in your own change-making journey. Like I said before, don't forget to check out my new website, changemakercafe.com for all of these resources and some special articles for you to check out. And you can subscribe to my newsletter, Changemaker Mondays. I'll leave the links to those things below, but with Changemaker Mondays, you're gonna get weekly insights on fundraising, startup practices, social entrepreneurship, and a lot more and some funding opportunities. So definitely check that out. All right. Like I said, I'll leave those links below this video and I'll see you next time. I'm Amber Melanie Smith signing out.